great breakfast. We want to say a big thank you to all the crew that helped downstairs, setting up the table, and everything that they've done. And it was amazing. And there was a lot of people behind the scenes who made uh, all kinds of stuff that we've never seen. But thank you to everybody for the work that they've done. Um, today is Pentecost Sunday. And it's reminding us of the day that the Holy Spirit came rushing in to this world to change our hearts. Wow, just thinking he came swooshing in here today with a mighty wind as he stops going to the scriptures. Uh, the announcements are in the bulletins, if, if you get them. But one thing I want to highlight is Song Fest coming up on June the 15th, 7 o'clock. Dig out those instruments out of your closet and come on out and uh, dust them off and tune up your vocal cords. It's not a talent show, so come on out and uh, we'll put some joy in your hearts and have some fun Wednesday, 15, 7 p.m. at the church here. Today we have a little different style of uh, music, a little different style of worship. We're at tables, we've got coffee. You don't have to pay any attention to us up here at all. You can just talk at the tables and have fun. And, um, but we want you to feel free to even maybe tap your foot to some of the music. I know it's a Baptist church, but we can do Pentecost Sunday. That's about it, really. So welcome to Bluegrass Sunday. And we also encourage you that you're welcome to stay seated during the music if you want yeah. to in this environment. This morning is Bluegrass Sunday for us. And bluegrass music began in the Appalachian Mountains of the U.S. In the 1800s, there were many immigrants coming from England, Ireland, and Scotland, and they settled in Kentucky, bringing with them their musical traditions of ballads, accompanied by the fiddle. Often bluegrass music tells the story of the everyday lives, everyday lives of these mountain people who worked hard to make a meager living in those mountains. At first, it was called hillbilly music. But in the 1950s, they began to call it bluegrass music. You might wonder if the grass in Kentucky is actually blue. No, it is green. But at times, the grass appears blue when it gets to about a foot tall and it develops blue flowers. So if the Canadian Tire, you see Kentucky bluegrass, that's why. One thing you will notice about bluegrass music is that they often speak about heaven. And to Tim and I, that is music to our ears, as we have a treasure up there. This first song speaks of that very place. This world is not my home. Join us. Thank you. 
Bennett was a pharmacist in New York, and one day a musician came into his drugstore. Like many musicians, he had a sensitive nature. He was subject, subject to depression and looked on the dark side of things in life. Dr. Bennett was at his desk, and as the musician walked by, he said, Webster, what's the matter now? Webster replied, it's no matter, it'll be all right by and by. The idea of him came to Dr. Bennett like a flash, and he penned the words as fast as he could write. He handed the words to Webster, and he began writing the notes. Taking his violin, he played the melody and jotted down the notes of, this cho of the chorus. In 30 minutes, the two men had written the song and were singing it. Join us in a sweet by and by. There's a land that is fair. And by faith we can see the Father. And the Father.
Jason on the bass, myself, Tim, and we can't do without my wife, Deanna, who puts everything together and tries to make us look good, although it's very good. <laughs> and, uh, today we have Liam, I'd like to introduce, that is reading the scriptures. He was a neighbor of ours back on Black Sturgeon, and now uh, is a very dear family friend and his mom and dad are with us today. Liam. <laughs> Good people, cheer God. Right living people sound best when praising. Use guitars to reinforce your hallelujahs. Play his praise on a grand piano. Compose your own new song to him. Give him a trumpet fanfare. Praise with a blast on the trumpet. Praise by strumming on soft strings. The priests then left the holy palace. All the priests there were consecrated, regardless of rank or assignment. And all the Levites who were musicians there, Asaph, Heman, and Jedithan, and their families dressed in their worship robes, the choir and the orchestra assembled on the east side of the altar and were joined by 120 priests blowing trumpets. The choir and the trumpets made one voice of praise and thanks to God, orchestra and choir in perfect harmony, singing and playing praise to God. Though the cherry trees don't blossom and the strawberries don't ripen, though the apples are warm eaten and the field, wheat fields are stunted, Though the sheep pens are sheepless and the cattle barns empty, I'm singing joyful praise to God. I'm turning cartwheels of joy to my Savior God. We're going to sing two songs now. The first one, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. And beginning in the 1960s, the practice of having a jazz band in your funeral possession began. Musicians would participate as a sign of respect for the deceased, and they would accompany the body from the home to the church and then to the cemetery. And Just a Closer Walk With Thee was the traditional tune most played at the funeral procession. The second song, Church in the Wildwood, was composed by a young music teacher, William Pitt. He was on a stagecoach going to visit his fiance, and the stagecoach stopped at the town of Bradford, Ohio. During the stop, he wandered through the woodlands and happened on a particular beautiful spot in a valley close to the Cedar River. An image formed in his mind of a church in that location, and he wrote a poem about that spot, and he later set it to music. Years later, when he returned to the area, he discovered a church had actually been built there. Not only that, the church had been painted brown, the color that he mentioned in the song, and the reason was that it was painted brown was the cheapest paint to be found. <laughs>
want to remind you that it's Pentecost Sunday, and we're just going to have a little feeding by the end. Talking about Pentecost. Today is Pentecost Sunday, the seventh Sunday after Easter, ten days after Jesus ascended to heaven. Pentecost Sunday is a commemoration and celebration of the receiving of the Holy Spirit by the early church. John the Baptist prophesied that the first Pentecost, when Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire, Jesus confirmed this prophecy with the promise of the Holy Spirit to the disciples in John 14, verse 26. He showed himself to these men after his death on the cross and his resurrection, giving convincing proofs that he was alive. Jesus told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the Father's gift of the Holy Spirit, from whom they would receive power to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. After Jesus' ascension to heaven, the men returned to Jerusalem and joined together in prayer in an upper room. On the day of Pentecost, just as promised, the sound of a violent wind filled the house, and tongues of fire came to rest on each of them, and they all were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were given the power of communication, which Peter used to begin the ministry for which Jesus had prepared him, and the coming of the Holy Spirit, after the coming of the Holy Spirit, the disciples did not stay in the room basking in God's glory, but burst out into the world. This was the beginning of the church as we know it. When the time for Pentecost was fulfilled, they were all in one place together, and suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. Then there appeared to them uh, tongues as of fire, which parted and came to rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. Amen. Jordan wants me to introduce himself, so as he comes to pray, this is Jordan. And he's our newest uh, elder, and it's neat to see uh, young men coming up through the ranks. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Second baby teacher voice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a great Sunday, uh, Pentecost. Um, coming out of the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, we have a shared unity. And I was just thinking this morning, um, what a great morning to just get to know each other a little bit more. Build the unity in the body of Christ. Paul talks about uh, so it's believers being the body, and it's great to get to know different parts of the body this morning. So it's been fun. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this morning we can gather, Lord, we could eat together, we could just grow in fellowship and get to know each other a little bit better. Lord, we just want to thank you this morning uh, for the message that you're going to deliver through Pastor Dave. We just pray you be with him as he shares this message. Be with us as we receive this message. Have our hearts open to hear what you have to say to us. Lord, we just want to lift up the children's ministries to you this morning in Jammers and down with the grades 1 to 6, Lord. We just pray that uh, the young years would be open. And Lord, we just thank you for the growth we've seen in these ministries over the past year. Lord, I just want to lift up those that can't be with us here this morning. I pray you'd be with them at home, whether they're catching the service online. Uh, we just pray they'd feel your presence this morning. And Lord, we just lift up those that are having any health challenges right now. We pray for healing over them. We pray for comfort, for peace over them. And Lord, we just pray for wisdom for their families and for their doctors. And Lord, we just pray you'd be with them this morning. Lord, I also just want to lift up our missionaries to you this morning. Wherever they're serving, I pray you just uh, fill them with joy for the mission that they're on. Lord, I pray you fill them with a renewed sense of energy this morning. And you just be with them. Bring them peace and keep them safe. And Lord, I just want to lift up the churches of Kenora. Lord, the body of Kenora, as uh, believers, Lord, I'm just, you know, uh, so excited to see the things that you're doing. I pray you just keep strengthening the churches of Kenora, Lord. Uh, be with them uh, all across Kenora. And just, Lord, I just pray for a unity uh, across this whole town, Lord, that, um, you know, Kenora's never seen before. And so, Father, we just thank you for this morning. We get to gather here, and we get to worship you. We get to fellowship with one another. We get to hear a message. And so, Father, we just thank you for this day and all that you've done for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And children can be dismissed. <coughs> thank you, workers, for looking after those kids downstairs and teaching them. Teach them about the Lord. I'll fly away. Some of you
you who like Southern Gospel music will recognize the name Albert Brumley. And you'll recognize his songs, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, If We Never Meet Again, Turn Your Radio On, remember that old song? Well, he recalled that one day as he was picking cotton, he hated that job, and he penned the words to Al Kiowa. We are in uh, lifted up, if you wish, uh, in the presence of the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, you sent your Son and your Spirit to be with us so that we would never be alone, that for eternity we could be with you. And so, Lord, let us seek your face today, eager to hear from you through your word ready to obey your voice, and willing to go where you send us. So we pray, in Christ's name, amen. Uh, I don't know about you, but today's a little different of a day, and uh, uh, I'm not used to having quite as full of a breakfast, so if I burp um, <laughs> when we're talking, that's fine. If I hiccup, I can't blame. Steve said I was pouring something in my drink. I can't say I know exactly. I'm thinking it was coffee, but... Uh, there you are. So uh, 
here we are, we're gathered here to, to really draw near to the Lord, right? That's what these days are about. It's a chance to pull near and draw and hear from God. And we've been talking a little bit about the Christian journey and, and some of the points that we have uh, on our Christian journey. And we've already touched a little bit on, on belief, what that really means, and faithfulness, being able to uh, uh, make a commitment towards that belief, dedication, how to, how to work through uh, and be dedicated, devoted uh, to Christ. And today we're going to look at uh, perseverance. And uh, when you look at that word, I think the first time I saw it, it was perseverance. And it took me a while to realize it's perseverance, the word. And uh, um, I want to give you a chance. We've got a unique setting here. We can kind of uh, talk a little bit around our tables and the like. So uh, I'd like to encourage uh, you right now just to talk at your table. Share next to you with somebody. And if you've got a, a onesie or a twosie, you might need to pull together with someone else to, to get a little closer together. But, but uh, talk um, and share uh, a moment where you needed perseverance to get through something. So just take a moment to do that and share with you. And we can see how perseverance kind of lines up with um, after uh, belief and uh, there's that list. That's the one. <laughs> belief, faithfulness, and dedication. We can see how perseverance kind of fits into that order. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about that order uh, from a from a, something maybe that you could picture for at least the guys. They might be able to picture this a little well. But it's kind of like uh, belief is like the concept. It's the design. Uh, the blueprints of the design, that once you grasp the concept of who God is, who Jesus is, uh, then you kind of want to hold on to it. And that's where faithfulness comes in. It's the frame or the structure. It's like putting wheels on the concept that, that you, have this, you have this understanding now and you want to put it into action, right? So, so belief is kind of putting things into action uh, or that is faithfulness is kind of putting things into action. Dedication now, that's more like the engine. 
It's the power behind your faith. It's what moves. It's what motivates you. It's, it's what drives you. You know, the you know, that dedication, that devotion we talked about uh, in that sense. Perseverance. Now, perseverance is your mechanic. When you run into difficulties, when you run into problems, how do you get through them? How do you get things fixed again? Perseverance is that desire to get it fixed and keep going. It's the sense of knowing that there is a journey ahead, there's a road that you must go on, there's a path forward. And even when you're not sure of the way, I think of, uh, uh, for those of you who are a little bit of the, uh, some of the Christian fantasy fans, I think of the um, Lord of the Rings, and I think of Bilbo Baggins when they have the Fellowship of the Ring and they've gathered around, uh, they're trying to figure out what to do with the, this, the, the ring that they've found. And as they're gathering there and they do so, and they're fighting, over it, and they're, they're, you can see kind of the power of the evil of the ring starting to cause division among the fellowship, among the group. And then all of a sudden, uh, Bilbo, uh, not Bilbo, sorry, Frodo, Frodo, all of a sudden Frodo grabs the ring and he says, though I don't know the way, I will go. And that's a sense of perseverance. Sometimes we don't know our way through something, but we know that we must persevere. We must journey on, we must go. We must make that effort to do so. So that's what perseverance is. And we need, sometimes, you know, it, when, our, when our, our engine seems to break, uh, or when we're, we're pulled over to the side of the road, we, you know, we, need, we need help, we need something more. Perseverance is kind of that, that, you know, that help that comes along that helps us to move through and to continue forward. Now today, as we've mentioned already, is Pentecost Sunday. And uh, this is uh, remembering of the giving of the Holy Spirit uh, to the church. Jesus said that he would never uh, be, uh, he would always be with us. He would never leave us nor forsake us, right? And he said he would be with us even to the end of the age. And it wasn't him personally, but it was his spirit. And it is him personally. And that's the uniqueness of trying to understand something really almost foreign for us is the Trinity, right? It, that Jesus is God and the Spirit is God. And the Spirit is Jesus, and so we have Christ in us and Christ with us. And uh, he told them to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 1, um, part of verse 4 and in verse 5, it says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to notice that this is one of those verses where you actually hear Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being mentioned together. You've got that Trinitarian mention in here where it says, you know, wait for the gift my Father promised, which you heard me speak about, um, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You've got those three there. That's one of those places where you see the three mentioned in a verse. And when it happened, it was like, unlike anything that they had ever experienced. But giving of the Holy Spirit wasn't just kind of, oh, you know, now I've got Jesus, my buddy. You know, uh, it's, it's more than that. You are filled with Christ. You're filled with God. You're filled with his spirit. And you were given his power to work through you. You're just the vessel, remember. He does the work in and through you. Uh, but now there's a purpose. There is a purpose. You have a purpose and Jesus talked about that purpose as well ahead of time. And again, we heard uh, allusions to that with some of the, the scriptures that were read and some of the, the talk that was going on. But in Acts 1 verse 8, it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That purpose is so that the power of God could be seen in us coming through us, but to be witnesses, to testify to the new covenant, to testify to Christ, that when they see us, they should see Jesus. And it should be in such a powerful way that they are compelled to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we are meant to be witnesses, and not just witnesses in here, but witnesses everywhere, right? That's a progression. It starts off with where they are at, 
And then it talks about going to the communities around them. Judea, that which is familiar to them, their country. Samaria, that which was hated by them. The next country they did not like, people who they would consider enemies. And then the ends of the earth, those places that are foreign to them, that they're not familiar with, that they're uncertain about, whom they would always have assumed were pagans and not welcome, not invited, but actually God has extended an invitation to the world. All can come. And the Holy Spirit enables and in end it equips them to be able to spread the good news. So when the day came, it actually foreshadowed this role of the church. And I'm going to read that in a second. I need some water. So in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 6, and I thank you, Liam, for already reading some of this. I'm going to read it again. read it again when I get it out from my phone. I usually print it off, and today I did not. Bad David, bad David. <coughs> All right, let me just call it up here. All right. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And another translation would be in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. And that was kind of a significant thing, because what we hear at this moment is a sense of a reversal of the curse that was put upon man at the Tower of Babel, where they were all together and united men, but they were seeking... <laughs> to be like God, and they were building a tower that would reach up to the heavens, and they were grasping for something that wasn't and shouldn't be theirs. And so God actually confounded them, confused their language so they couldn't understand and speak together, so they wouldn't work in unity against God. And he had them be separated into different languages and thus different nations. But it was always his desire to bring them back together. And we see the role of the church is God's heart saying that the gospel, the good news, is for all. And we see that demonstration that it is for all when he speaks in the various different languages of all the people that are gathered together. Now, at that time, it would have been Jewish people from around the diaspora that would have come in. Diaspora means just kind of where they were scattered throughout the known world. And, uh, and three times a year, there was a mandate for them to come into the festivals. Now, sometimes it was impractical for them to make it three times a year, but there was an effort to try to be there as often and as regularly as they could. So at these festivals, there were lots of people, Jewish people, from uh, scattered across the known Roman Empire that would be coming in. And so they name all those nations, and they name all the different languages that would become their, that would have been their first language, and the second language for them would have been uh, would have been the Aramaic or the, the Hebrew language for them to know and to know their word. And so here we see that it's spoken in their own native language, this which is happening. That invitation is a foreshadowing of the role of the church that then goes out to all nations to share and good, give the good news. And that actually is the call of the church. Our role today is still to share the good news with those who would be in our Jerusalem, Kenora, those who would be in our Judea, those we're comfortable with, those we're familiar with, those that are, we call friends, those that would be in our Samaria, those we don't like, those who are enemies. How do we show the gospel, give the gospel to them? And those who are to the very ends of the earth, those we can't even relate to. You know, some of us, that might be our son or daughter. Because <laughs> things can change so drastically in our cultures, often through generation, right? Uh, that is actually the call of us even to today. Uh, both literally going to different places and figuratively those that would seem to us like they're, they're just in a different world, different culture. 
And uh, as we think about this, and we think about the church, and we've just read through Acts, and we can see that as this was being done, and being acted out, lived out by the early church, it came with many challenges. I would say that perseverance was clearly needed to be able to do that, as we see modeled just if we read the book of Acts alone. Perseverance was needed because persecution was often accompanied with their efforts of reaching out and of sharing the good news. It's good news, right? So why is it that we're always in opposition with people? Why do people not want to hear such good news? It's a good question, but it's true. If any of you have ever shared your faith with somebody who doesn't believe, you know it's not always well received. And sometimes it's hostile, the reactions that we receive. And I'd like to ask that you talk at your tables right now again and share about how you feel about sharing your faith with another. Maybe share an experience or two. Please feel free to talk. Finding me is, uh, I love my body the best. And we sort of find where I
Sometimes God just sort of opens a door and it feels natural and you just feel like, thank you, Lord, for giving me that opportunity or what a thing to see that happen. But other times we know it's difficult. We know it's difficult in us. It's hard for us to work up, to speak to certain people, even when we feel a compelling nudge by the Spirit to do so. And it's difficult in the conversation itself where some people have just seemed really close to it, even hostile to it. It's difficult to, the, to do that. And we might see that as persecution today. We might see that as, as opposition to the gospel. But what if we faced real persecution? What if being a Christian, and they knew that you're a Christian, you didn't even have to say anything, but if they knew that you were a Christian, you could lose your job. Or you would be isolated in your community. Um, and your livelihood is threatened. Maybe your physical well-being, you're threatened to be attacked or beaten up, or even killed. That's a real thing that happens for Christians in this world today and parts of the world. If they seek to be a Christian, they actually know all of this comes with it. And here's the amazing thing. In most of those countries, the gospel not only lives but thrives. It may move underground, um, but it thrives. It does so because they can see the hollowness of what is being offered in the world around them. And they can see the real hope that is offered in Jesus' good news of eternal life and a better model to live. They don't know how to do it in that environment. They don't know what it means to be a Christian other than they're compelled to do so. And they know almost coming out of the gate that belief, faith, um, dedication, and perseverance are needed. Those line up very quickly for them. Sometimes for us, we kind of have a longer journey to believe, you know, a, a longer journey for faithfulness, a longer journey for dedication, and uh, a longer journey for per perseverance. But in countries like that, it can be one, two, three, four, they come quick. Because you have to be persevering in your faith. Likewise, in the early church, we hear about how the apostles faced many challenges. And uh, Peter, some might say, you know, one of the, the apostle leaders of uh, the early church movement, understood the challenges that the early church faced. And in his first letter, 1 Peter, first chapter, he writes the following in verses 5 to 7. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. Now, this is a progression as well, and it's not that different from what we've been talking about for the progression that we have. We see a similar thing where things progress and it starts kind of at a place where he starts with faith. We just started with belief that comes to faith, right? And, and, and it has a progression that goes forward. And uh, we also see how it, it goes to one point. It leads after perseverance. It goes to godliness and mutual affection. Mutual affection. Here we got that language about being called to unity again. That language about we're meant to be together. That no man is an island, despite what Simon and Garfunkel sing about. I mean, there is that sense that we are meant to do this journey together. And we need to do that together. And so often, we're bad at that. We'd rather hold on to differences. We'd rather look at the objections to why I shouldn't be, or so-and-so has hurt me or offended me, or I'm not getting back together with them until they apologize. I'm waiting for them to come to my house. You know, we do these things when actually the role that we should be doing is striving to repair, aiming to be together, mutual affection. You know what affection is? It's, it's kind of just below love, right? Just below love. 
It should be something in which we, we aim for that invitation to be so tight together. Not just acquaintances, and not just friends, but better than friends. Someone you can count on. Every one of us should be like that for each other. That is much of the message we've been hearing over the past three weeks. Now we're on to four weeks, right, where this is carrying forward. It's so important that we do that and not hold on to differences, not hold on to grudges, not hold on to mistakes in understanding. Communications, boy, we're bad at communication. We read into things that isn't there. We assume things that shouldn't be. We need to change that. We need to assume the best. We need to come in and say, I, I may have misread this. This is what I meant. And I apologize if I've hurt you. That's so important that we do that. So we recognize that leads from mutual affection to love, right? This is a progression. We're walking a progression. Our Christian journey is a progression. And when you know better, you do better. And you seek to correct. You seek to do so. Let us do that better, folks. Let us do that together. Now, what's nice about 1 Peter 1, verses 5 to 7, is that it goes on to explain a little bit more in verses 8 to 9. It says, For if you possess these qualities in increasing me measure, so they know that this is a journey that you go on and you work on, increasing measure, we're always growing, right? We're always learning. I, can, I might think that I have... Uh, don't ever say that you have perseverance down, because God will make sure he'll test you on that, right? Uh, but you might think you're doing well in your journey, but I can tell you, the minute you say that, you're not doing well. We always have much to learn. So if you possess these qualities in increasing, increasing measure, they will keep you, keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. All of us have stumbling blocks in our journey where we actually are ineffective and unproductive. We stop reading God's word because we're angry at God, or we're feeling just a weight, or we're getting dragged down, all right? And right now, life feels like an anchor, and we're having a hard time getting back to that. I want you to know we've all been there. I don't want you to feel bad if you're in that place. We just pick up our socks and continue forward. We pray to God, we turn to God in this. And then it goes on to say, but whoever does not have them, in other words, if you're not pursuing these things, you're not walking down this increasing measure of progression towards Christ. Whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Now, when they use language like unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's a confusing word for knowledge. And I want us to, to recognize it's not head knowledge here, this is experiential knowledge. Our knowing, you know, I know. I know my wife. I know what she's going to say when I get home in the car, especially if I've made a foot and mouth or I've used her as an example. I know <laughs> what's coming next, right? That's, that's not just head knowledge. There's an experience there, right? And there's an experience with this, right? And this is an experiential knowledge, right? Um, being cleansed from past sins helps us to see that what he means is this type of knowledge. It's an experiential knowledge. We already know Christ forgives us of our sins. We already know that he cleanses us from what we've done wrong. And when we, we talk about Jesus washing the feet of the apostles on, the, on, on the, that day um, before he or during the, the day of the Last Supper, right? And he's about to be crucified. And he, he says to Peter, when Peter says, well, wash all of me, he says, you don't need to. You've already had your bath. You've already been fully cleansed. You already believe in me. But you still have to wash each other's feet. You still have to forgive each other. There's still something that, we still pick up dirt on our journey. We still need cleansing that way, right? So we see in here, that we are to walk as dedicated and holy vessels. That's the experience of knowledge. God has done something for us, and now we have an opportunity to be used by him. And to be dedicated, to be holy vessels, to be set apart for the Lord, perseverance is needed for this. Because we all know it's so easy to just go with the crowd, to just go with the flow. Do you remember that, you know, the Christian symbol that's on the back of many cars? Maybe you have one of those, or whatever. What's the purpose of that symbol? The fish is swimming in the opposite direction, right? It's going upstream. But if it doesn't move, do you think it stays in the same place? The stream's still moving, right? You go with that, right? You get dragged downstream. 
Drift is what happens. If you don't work at things, you will drift in your faith. You have to swim upstream. You have, it's perseverance. There's work involved in that word. We don't like that, but it's true. There's work involved in that life. Perseverance is needed. Now, I want you to talk at your tables about your experiences of trying to live in holiness, in opposition to the world around you. How do you, how do you work out your faith in fear and trembling? How do you work out your faith in your work around you? So spend some time talking.
<laughs> All right, once again, pull us back together. As we, uh, as we've talked and we've shared a bit about that, it's 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 always a struggle to live out your faith, and it doesn't matter whether that's that's right here in Kenora or elsewhere in the world. There's always a struggle to live out your faith. It, it's going to be a challenge. It's actually the journey that we have is one in which we do stand out, even when we're not supposed to stand out, even when there's a cause, consequence or a cause for that. But done well, um, it can be a powerful witness in how we live our life and, and the things and the words that we say, even when, you know, the, the, to speak the name of Jesus actually means to be arrested, expelled, killed, otherwise, right? There's still ways in which we exemplify our, our life and our living in a way that actually tells people we're a Christian. We were talking about that at, at our table here. You don't there's some places where you're just, you're not allowed to, but you still find a way that people seem to know that you're a Christian, and they want to ask questions. And if they ask, you actually have more permission to talk about it, right? Um, it's so important, and I'm so thankful that we have God's Spirit with us, that, that His Spirit has come into us to guide us, to give us discernment, to give us conviction, to give us kind of a, a Holy Spirit nudge, right? You know, and... Uh, uh, um, well, it's E and I, there's a song that says, a kick a love, right? <laughs> It'll get you in gear, right, uh, at times. Um, that promise by God's Spirit that he would never leave us nor forsake us, that the Holy Spirit would be in us, giving us wisdom and discernment, he would convict us, that he would be our counselor, that he would help us, he would guide us, it's so important. We forget how important the day of Pentecost really is because our whole understanding of God is based on the fact that he is very near. In fact, he's in us. He's with us. Christ in us. Us in Christ. Christ before us. Christ behind us. We have him under us, uplifting and holding us. Holy Spirit convicts us of our own behaviors, too. Have you ever had that conviction where, ah, I knew I should have said something and I didn't? Have you ever had that conviction, that sense of knowing, oh, I blew this. I had an opportunity. Sometimes it's actually bad behavior, right? We actually participate in something that we know the Lord is saying, we shouldn't go there. And we've done that, right? We're guilty of those things, too. But here's a beautiful thing. Not only does the Holy Spirit convict us but if we listen and then we hear and obey, like listen in, in Hebrew understanding, Shema is a hear and obey, right? It's a sense of, of going that extra mile, not just hearing, but hearing and obeying. When we listen that way, the Holy Spirit cleanses us. And the gift of Pentecost that we're celebrating today on Pentecost Sunday, we're remembering, uh, is actually a gift for us every day, isn't it? To know that we have him with us at all times. To know that when we make mistakes, it's not the end. Right? It's not like, okay, that's it, I'm done. I gave you your chance. Actually, 70 times 7, and that language, 70 times 7, that we're forgiven, that God extends to us, really means forever. Every time someone is repentant and comes to you, you forgive. Because that's what Jesus does to us. And how many times do we need that? Daily. I need his forgiveness. Daily, I've said or done something wrong, usually before I get out of bed. <laughs> and I need to ask for forgiveness, sometimes from my wife, but always from the Lord. Perseverance is what we need. Don't let the mistakes hold us back. The Holy Spirit allows us to persevere. And when things get tough, it should bring us to our knees in prayer. We should turn to God, press in, and by His Spirit, He will help us to continue on. And, and realize that when we ask for forgiveness, when we want that cleansing, right, we're actually saying that we um, not only uh, have we confessed, but that we repent. You know, have, we have confessed that what we've done is wrong, or what we, we've missed out on an opportunity, things left undone, as well as the things that were done, right? 
Um, we confess and we repent. We seek to change. We turn away from what was wrong. And we seek to do what is right. And he will help us to continue on. He will help us to keep our focus on him. And in a sense, it's the Holy Spirit that's our mechanic. He keeps the dedication engine running. He fixes us and he cleanses us. He tunes us up. He enables for us to go the miles that we need to go to complete the long, hard road ahead. The Holy Spirit repairs our relationship with God, repairs our relationships with each other, and repairs how we see the world around us. We don't have to blame. We don't have to get angry. We don't have to stay in the valley that we're in. We can be lifted up and someday we'll fly away. Someday we'll be with him. When life gets hard, God has given us a counselor, an advocate, himself in spirit form, and he will enable us to persevere. And that's a great place to be looking at communion at this time. So you'll know on your tables, and if you're sitting on a side seat, you're going to need to go to a table and get, um, get your communion cup. And I, I'm going to apologize once again. Those are very convenient cups for us in terms of uh, going through COVID and the like. They're sterilized. They're individually wrapped. They helped us a lot through that, and we're going to continue this through till the summer. Um, Lord willing, if things continue to open up a little bit, we'll come back to what we know for communion, but in the meantime, these are what we have. And uh, they're tricky, because there's two tabs there. One tab opens up your wafer, the other tab opens up your wine, and sometimes you tear off the wrong tab, and you now you've got a complete hermetically sealed piece of wafer that you can't get into these right? So uh, uh, I'll give you a chance to kind of get that and to get yourselves ready. But I want us to know, I want you to know, I want myself to know, that as we take communion, we do this corporately because we remember what Christ did for us, how we are part of the body now. And he said, this is my body broken for you, right? When he said that, right, we have this sense of this being something in which things get um, broken in us, right? You know, we're part of his body. And I think that we want that resurrection body so badly, right? We want to be in that place where we have that resurrection body. And uh, it's so important that we know and recognize that uh, our body is broken, and Christ forgives. So as we take this and we remember, I want us to keep in mind this passage of Scripture that says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we may come out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Which means basically we all sin. We all need him. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. And he broke it, blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat this, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my body broken. Let us eat in remembrance of what he's done for us.
And as we remember, and as we think about all that the Lord has done for us, he didn't just die for our sins, but he was raised to life. We look upon an empty cross and an empty tomb because our Lord and Savior is alive and well. And we too have that promise of eternal life, eternal union with him. And that is the beautiful thing about communion. Is it's a remembrance of all that he has done and continues to do for us. And his Holy Spirit advocates for us, counsels us, guides us, comforts us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you have done. And as you hear behind me, we have some beautiful melody of a beautiful song. Um, and when we think of perseverance, we can think about that culture of bluegrass and the people who had to need much perseverance. There are often poor people in great need. But they understood who their Savior was. And we can too. So let us sing together the old red cross. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.